stuff is coming together. We have both toys, manga, and our books on there now. We have decided that we have got to get another bookshelf because we have a lot of books. We still have books in boxes. We still have books in the garage. And we definitely need more bookshelves. So I think we're going to get another tall shelf and another short shelf. As you can see, the living room is slowly coming together. We moved Callie's cat condo out side we've got her new litter area over here with a sleep area and then we have a sleep area over there with her kitty tower the house is slowly coming together but we keep bringing in newer boxes to break stuff down new kitchen boxes to break down and i've still got to figure out where i'm going to put my stoneware because i got a lot of places to move stuff but it's all coming together and i'm excited about it Alright y'all, if you're seeing this right now, um, the tail end of Halloween, it was a rough day. I had already a rough night's sleep the day before, and I had still decided to get up, try to get the day started, take care of the family best I could, get my exercise on, which I was excited about, because I was like, I will use the phone to tape instead of trying to use the camcorder and get as much footage as I could, get the full 30 minutes without having it split up like the camcorder was doing, and without the having to figure out the AVI conversion. So all looked good. It seemed like it taped the whole entire 30 minutes. But when I went to go upload it, it only had the last 10 seconds of me saying that I wanted to record this and stopping. So that was trick number one for this Halloween. Trick number two was I went to the kitchen to set up the studio for the Bonnet Chronicles and decided to tape the, you know, kitchen stuff that I like to do for the home vlog. And I talked about family. I talked about my grandfather and my grandparents in general and just some touching stuff and didn't realize that I didn't have the microphone connected. And all of that is pretty much lost to me. So it was kind of a rough day today. I really envy those who fully give their all to content creating, and I'm not just saying that to kiss people's ass, because honestly, it does take a lot of work and dedication to catch this. The whole reason why the microphone was off is because I was trying to convert the AVI files from my camcorder onto uh, workable files with OBS, and because Axiom Wolf was hanging up pictures, he was banging the hammer. So I was like, okay, I will mute the mic, I will record the video stuff, and I will fully MacGyver this. And no, that didn't work out. I <laughs> thought I did it properly, and when I rewatched the playback of what I did put up, I realized how much I messed up. So this is a learning process, y'all, and I'm hoping the rest of the week goes better. I'm definitely going to try to get a full night's sleep because when you don't get enough sleep, it just throws the whole day off. But we're going to get ready to watch some Halloween movies, try to get our mood back into a better mood. Action Wolf gets off of work in about an hour. So I'm looking forward to that. Just to take my mind off of how crummy today kind of was for everything. You know, I really am going to do my part to show you guys how 30 minutes on the bike is without it being you looking at a Windows Media Player recording of me. I just, I get so annoyed though, because it's like, I, I have these good ideas, I think I'm executing them, and then the reality is, no, it doesn't always work out that way. 
but I wanted to be honest with you since it is a home vlog and I'm trying to chronicalize the week by week thing, you know, I honestly thought I would have good content today and it just didn't work out. I did at least get 44 minutes of a decent bond chronicles once I realized my sound was out. And thank goodness my partner came out when he did, because if I had gone a full hour of me blabbing and not getting any of that sound recorded, I think I would have cried. I still feel like crying again because the heartfelt stuff I talked about earlier, I'm not going to remember that. I do a lot of this off the cuff as I'm going, and I don't want to pre-record this. This is reality. This is my real life. So maybe tomorrow I'll have better stuff to talk about. Who knows? All I do know is I do regret that the stuff I talked about with family didn't get recorded. And I'm going to have to think about it again and, and really talk about it because it was some hard stuff talking about the loss of grandparents and, you know, just, just the past. It's, it's really tough for me to talk about the past as it is. So opening up the way I did, tearing up a little bit, that was rough. I don't know, y'all. I just wanted to get this part taped because I can actually record it properly today. And hopefully tomorrow will be a better day. But for now, I am going to get ready to wrap this up and go watch some movies and try to take my mind off of how rough today was. And happy Halloween if you watch this part. Let's try this again, y'all. We tried this yesterday. Set this up. Do our exercises early. Because I wanted to get a full 30 minutes tape. And yesterday was kind of more tricks than treats. So it's Halloween. So we are going to try today to get my stuff done early. It's an early day. Make sure it actually records this thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah
days where our moods are super low, days where it's just really super tough to get motivated, period. And then you have manic ups. And I think people don't understand that it's not just the down, it's not just the crying or the drinking that you see some people display on this app. It really is a up feeling, you get a lot of stuff done. It, it's kind of almost like a high. That's the best way I can explain it. You just have energy to do a lot of things, but your brain sometimes isn't working with you. You'll be full of energy, but your mind is going 50,000 places. And then you can hear a bunch of things. And it's really, really hard to focus. I don't understand people that try to fake what I have because I don't want what I have. If I could be 100% honest, if I could trade any of my illnesses, I would keep the fat and get rid of the mental health stuff. Because fat can get rid of, it's going to take time, it's going to be slow. But the mental health stuff is rough. There are days where I really, really just am not concentrate or focus because my mind is just not working with me. And I never used to think that it would be a burden or a problem or anything because I used to ignore it. I'm of the generation that you normally don't even talk about mental health. And that was bad. And now that I'm learning how to really navigate dealing with this, it is really hard for me to see people talk about mental health and not understand how many of us are out here. How many of us are doing everything we can to just live, survive, and not let this destroy us. People with schizophrenia especially have high mortality rates because a lot of times we get that dark moment and we just don't want to be here. And I work really hard, even on days where I'm feeling really mad, to just not let it get to me. It helps having support. But there are a lot of people out there with what I have that don't have support, don't have YouTube channels, so you don't see realities normally. And I don't say this for pity. Honestly, as a diagnosed sociopath, your pity wouldn't do anything for me anyway. And I think people need to bluntly hear that because too many people say it and you think they're being funny. I'm not being funny. I mean it. Pity doesn't work for me. Sympathy, it's nice, but I'm not going to feel it in the way a normal person does. So as much as it might seem appreciated, you don't have to waste your time if you don't want to. I honestly am just doing this basically for myself. Document how we make this whole mark. Document how actual weight loss takes, especially if you're dedicated to it. But I'm not going to play games with people. There are parts of my life that I don't think should be on display. I think when there is a manic low, you're not feeling the energy to vlog yourself or record it. That is just my experience with dealing with this. That's why whenever I cancel the Bonnet Chronicles, I let the people who actually come to watch it know it's not a good day, y'all. It's not a good day. I can't do it today. I need a break. I am feeling super low. And I think it's important, especially now that I'm older, to listen to those cues. Nobody wants to sit in front of a camera talking politics and social issues when you are feeling the abyss full of depression. But too many people on YouTube use mental health as a reason to act out, engage in vices that only make it worse if you do have those issues. And then they're like, oh guys, this is how people with mental health act all the time. I know there's millions of us, so there's a wide spectrum of people who literally handle their problems in a different way. And I forgot to do my 10 minute hour. But you've got people who get on this app and they stalk and harass people. You've got people who get on this app and they just, they're a mess for views. And then they try to blame things like undiagnosed mental health problems or they classify themselves with mental health issues because they Google doc. 
they Google doctor their sickness. And it's frustrating because when I got my first diagnosis, I was a kid when I got told that I had mental health problems. <clears throat> they didn't give me an official diagnosis until I was in my 20s. And I was in full denial. You couldn't tell me that I had anything wrong with me, even though I knew something had to be off. There were days where I don't remember anything because I wasn't lucid. I don't know where my mind was or where I was even. And then there were days where I did remember the lucidity days. The lucidity days. Days where even after like people passed, I was able to see and talk to them clearly. And I had to know that it wasn't right. But back then, I didn't know. I thought what happened to me really happened. And it is a scary feeling. That's why I don't understand the people that want this. I don't understand the people that push to have stuff like this. Because if you do, you don't. You don't want this. It is, you don't have control over it, first of all. And I need people to understand that. The lucid tin that you see right now is years of work. Years of therapy, getting my family nonsense out of the way, getting my house peaceful and quiet, working on myself slowly but surely so that my mind doesn't completely break from this. And I feel like there are way too many people that think it's easy to live with this and that it's just a game and that it's like a switch, like my sociopathy's empathy button. Yeah, I can turn off feeling certain emotions, but I can't turn off my mental health because it's forever. And it's like I said, without support, without help, millions of people suffer from this and it always ends up negatively if you don't have a support system and a way to take care of yourself. Because your mind is literally your worst enemy with this. And that's why I get so passionate about talking about it now because there are far too many people who treat mental health as a joke. Not only do they treat it as a joke, but they treat it as if it's interchangeable, which is frustrating enough because it's not. They use things like manic without even understanding what manic means are. <laughs> and for a schizophrenic especially, I constantly see negative portrayals of everything that I legitimately live through. And we're always portrayed as either violent killers or just... I'm a weirdo. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't like people so much. I try to keep to myself because of it, because of the paranoia. But I'm not out there thinking about hurting people like that. I don't quite understand the mindset. But I will tell people that the things I can justify violence-wise is in the realms of protecting myself. If I feel like I'm in danger, I could justify harming a person until the person is no longer breathing. And that is why I stay away from people. Because that is the reality of being able to mentally justify, I need to just protect myself. I try not to let my life be ruled by fear so that I never have to get in that situation. But there were plenty of times I came close and it scared me into just calming down. One of the worst times, and I hate bringing up the past like this because it feels like, you know, it's something I should have let go, but I talk to my therapist about this because it's important. When I was in New York, I used to fight a lot. Like, I was one of those girls that had to prove myself. So if somebody fucked with my family or a friend, they could get me and I would get involved. And normally I would use my fist because I felt better after I fought. It was kind of the only therapy we had back then. And one day we were in junior high. It was seventh, maybe, yeah, seventh grade. We were all outside. And my best friend, Christine, at the time had an older sister, Barbara, who I originally was friends with. And she had an accident, had to leave school because... You know, she fell down some stairs, 
and it really slowed her learning process, so they put her in a special school. But then by junior high, we were all back in school together. So both Christine and I were super protective of Barbara. She was like a, another sister to both of us, because Christine and I were like sisters. We loved each other. She was my best friend. And whew, this girl was just tormenting Barbara for weeks on end. I don't understand her problem. I don't know what her deal was, but she decided that Barbara was her target. And if you know anything about me, I don't like bullies, like point blank. I don't mind sass or insults, and I'll get to that in a bit, but I don't like people who bully and torment, especially special needs people. Oh, you will set 10 all the way off. <laughs> so I was already heated. And we're out on the playground, and the girl decides, in front of all of us, I guess to see if we would do anything, to start with Barbara. To hit her and make fun of her. And I was like, you're not going to do that. And I was dead serious. I calm, but dead serious. You are not going to mess with Barbara. So the girl looks at me, smirks, hot spit onto me. It's like completely hawks a uh, huge thing of spit on me. According to my friends, because I don't remember a lot of what happened outside at that moment, I got this insane look in my eyes. Like my eyes flashed so angrily that the girl instantly showed fear and took off running. When she took off running, I went running after her. I chased her up into the school because I don't know if you know about New York school buildings. They are large. Even our junior high school. Large buildings, a lot of staircases. She could have lost me if she had been smart, but she wasn't smart. She was dumb enough to spin on me. So I had psycho rage mode at that point. Because <laughs> you don't spin on me. I chased her up some stairs. Because I was smaller and fitter back then. It was junior high. Chased her into the girl's bathroom. Cornered her and started pummeling her. Held her by her head and just kept punching and the only thing that saved that girl's life was my hand got tired. Then I remember the dean coming to the bathroom because a lot of kids, when they realized what happened, had followed and was crowding, of course, because it's New York City. So, of course, two girls fighting each other was a big deal. And it really wasn't a fight. I literally held her and punched her head in. Messed up her eye and everything. I didn't care. I wanted to kill her. And I, I will be honest about that now. Because I know it wasn't a healthy mindset, but I, I really wanted to destroy her life for spitting on me. And that is a dark thought. When I came out of the bathroom after I beat the crap out of this girl, the team was like, are you done? And I just nodded, yup. I should have got in trouble. And I will be 100%. If I didn't have such good grades, and I wasn't a normally good, quiet student, with regards to the teachers and just doing what I normally would do. I think I would have gotten suspended or in some serious trouble. But because I explained to them everything that happened and I agreed to go to the guidance counselor once a week to talk out my issues, which I really did. And I don't even think Mr. Whitman listened to me half the time. But I made all the concessions they wanted me to. I didn't get in trouble. I should have gotten in trouble. I found out later on the extent of the damage that my pummeling did to that girl's face and eye. <laughs> I feel bad now because I should have kept calmer. But when I get that level of anger, I just, I can't describe it. It is bad. So I am so glad that I didn't do something worse. Because there's no coming back from something like that. There really isn't. After that, fighting got a little less common. I calmed down some. I had to teach my own sibling not to try to pull me into every fight that she started. I got her to start fighting her own battles after that, too. By high school, I wasn't known as a fighter anymore. But for some reason, junior high school seemed to test me. I remember having to fight a guy that literally in the middle of history class, which is already, history is my favorite class of all time. So I constantly am paying attention, 
happy. It's, it was my happy place to study history, even back then as a kid. I know I'm a weirdo. I don't care. But I had this kid that grew up with us, right down the block from our house. So he knew my family well enough. And he probably didn't know stuff about my mother that I didn't want people to know. But he lied and told the whole class that he saw my mom smoking a certain substance in a car. And I don't know why he decided that day was going to be the day. But that was the day Chen chose violence too. And I'll never forget the look on my history teacher's face. He looked so horrified and then just sad because of the way I got up and just started pummeling this guy in his desk. And then he, was, he said something else, and then I started hitting him again. And I was just like, I need to calm down. This is not a healthy way to handle stuff. And I think it's why later on in my life, I took a lot of things I probably shouldn't, because I thought it was doing penance for how violent I was as a kid. And I thought that if I took certain abusing things that I would make up for what I did, and you can't have that mindset either. Nobody should be allowed to harm you so that you can atone for things you did in your past. And it's such a weird, messed up mindset. And I just really hope that talking about this and being open with people about this help you understand that you don't have to have a one for one. Yeah, you might mess up on this journey, especially when it comes to your mental health. It's telling you, your mind is like your literal worst enemy in, in, in even your best days at times. And not everybody can channel it creatively. Some of the best artists, musicians, athletes, everybody who you look up to probably has some form of mental health, anxiety, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed, because our minds just work in a different way. I was able to channel my stuff into the creative writing because I loved writing out my feelings. So it really is easier for me to write stuff than it is anything else. But if I didn't have writing, I don't know where I'd be right now. I can see why some people give in to certain vices. So I'm not even going to pretend like, oh, people with mental health don't drink, don't do drugs. Because you, <laughs> when your mind is behaving the way our minds do, it is rough to focus and keep your thoughts organized and not hear things or see things. <laughs> so a lot of times people will lean in to a substance that helps calm things a bit. But for me, I don't like non-lucidity. I like the world that I see to actually be the world I'm in. With the exception of digital stuff, because I'm online chronically like everybody else. But it is super frustrating. Super hard to uh, deal with at times. Now, I'm hoping this fully taped, y'all. Because last, yesterday, I really did talk about some really heavy topics from my past, too. I talked about the Challenger explosion because... You know, I was watching stuff about ocean and space travel and made the point that 80% of the ocean is explored because we're not capable of doing it yet. We could develop the technology, but we're all too busy, you know, worshiping wealth hoarders. So I guess it was good that my rant against the wealth hoarders didn't get taped, especially since one of those wealth hoarders technically pays a portion of my bills with, with what I do on Twitch. But it is frustrating for me that we humans have the capabilities of being better when it comes to tech and stuff, especially since the digital age is upon us, and we still don't. And I talked about how the first moment in history gave me the idea that adults will betray kids. Because like many kids in elementary school, we watch what happened with the Space Shuttle Challenger. We saw that explosion because it was the 80s. Back then, everything was bigger, better, badder. And the news kept going on for months on end about the teacher who was going up in the space. So I don't know many schools that didn't pull the TV in and let, at least from fourth grade up, watch what was going on. Because a lot of us, that was the age where you wanted to start 
molding careers and paths and science was big back then for those that were considered smarter. So I remember Miss Darcy, our fourth grade teacher, reeling the TV in, everything being hooked up. We get the live stuff. I don't know if there was like a, a special channel they put on or what, but I remember seeing Cape Canaveral for the first time because we're a New York kid. You know, we knew other states existed because we weren't like the Dada kids. I hate using that word Dada, but stuff. You know what I mean. We weren't the kids that were kept away. We understood there were 50 states. We knew our geography and all of that. But we had never, a lot of us never really left New York at that point, fourth grade. I've been all over the state, but I never really left the state much. Jersey doesn't count because <laughs> Jersey's so freaking close. Um... Seeing Florida was already magical, but seeing the actual shuttle lift off felt like enchanting at first. And then all of a sudden, we saw fire and smoke, and it looked like it exploded. Now, I know now that I'm older and it's been explained and shown other footage that it actually crashed instead. And that spark and shower of flames we saw was just the initial uh, things, overings and stuff, doing their thing. But back then, to a four-year-old, fourth grader, not four-year-old, to a fourth grader, I was about eight or nine, you don't know what's going on. And that would have been the perfect moment for the teacher at that point to say, okay, we just saw a tragedy. We just saw something very dangerous and, and we don't know what's going on, but let's talk about it. And instead, she turned the TV off. She rolled it out and that was it for the day. She didn't want to talk. And I get that people process grief in a different way, but nobody in the school wanted to talk about what we saw. Nobody in the school wanted to help us kids figure out what the fuck we just watched. I had to go home and talk to my grandma. And it was good that I had a grandmother who wasn't afraid to let me express just the confusion, the sadness. We sat and we watched World News Tonight. That was one of our favorite things to do. World News Tonight in Jeopardy. She, she was like, I was an old soul or something. I don't know. I, I, I just... I found that stuff fascinating, and especially once Peter Jennings became the host of it, that was like our nightly routine, and I loved it. I, I really miss those days some days. But it was hard to deal with people who avoid stuff instead of working it out, and it taught me a toxic way of handling things that I'm still trying to undo, because if you don't confront an issue properly, handle and confront an issue properly, you do toxic stuff. And when you have something so traumatizing as seeing all those lives on that shuttle potentially gone then, because to us as kids especially, it looked like we just watched a bunch of people die, which we literally did. And the school could have handled it so much better than they did, and they didn't. I remember when I was on the site that I'm no longer on, because it's being run into the ground by a ratty billionaire. And that was something somebody brought up. What was your first historical memory? And I'm sure some people will bring up September 11th because we've all lived through some dark moments in history now if you've been alive for it over 10 years. But uh, for me, my first dark memory of history was the Challenger explosion and just the way it was handled. And it just troubles me that adults will do that to kids. Adults will act like we're just too young to try to talk about what we see or too young and stupid to really process or maybe they didn't see what they seen. And it's like, we all were watching it. You wanted us to watch it. You had the TV taped on it and you didn't explain. And to this day, it is one of the first, I'd say, real feelings of betrayal I had for adults in authority. And it's probably what shapes the way I am with society. It's probably one of the main reasons why I feel so antisocial most days. Because there's no trust for me with people. 
It's hard to have trust when people just want to avoid problems. They don't want to actually try to solve them. They don't really want to work through them healthily. They lean into violence so much. And I know, ironic, after I talk about fight and talk about how other people lean into violence. But it is true. It feels like there are a lot of people that abuse what this is like. And it makes it hard for me to want to deal with them. It is on a person-by-person -person basis. And I don't trust a lot of people anymore because of this. It's not easy. And like I said, ain't saying this for pity. Honestly, wouldn't know what to do with your pity even if you offered it. But I do think that a lot of what I've gone through is a combination of both good and really not so good things in my life. And I'm just glad I'm still here. I think if I can have any takeaway from this, is that I am glad that this hasn't beaten me and that I'm going to do everything I can to still be here and be a contributing force of positive instead of a constant negative caricature of what this health crisis is. Because way too many people treat what we go through as if it's interchangeable or if it's an act and it's just... It's tiring, y'all. But I'm hoping that this fully taped. I did my 30 minutes. I did my 10, maybe a little bit more of arms. I'm feeling better today than I did yesterday. I didn't get a lot of good sleep, so that was rough. But I do feel like I got a lot done today already. We get my exercise done early. I can get the house taken care of, get my shower, take care of Kelly Kitten, wherever she is. But <clears throat> whew, I'm just glad I was able to hopefully get this recorded and talk to it to you about mental health and just the realities of living with this because I really truly don't think people understand how hard it can be some days to navigate with this. And too many people think that it's easy to fake. Oh, I told a therapist that I hear voices, okay? What are the voices saying? Do you have conversations with them? Are they malicious voices or beneficial voices? Because some of us hear very beneficial voices. But they don't want to talk about those of us that have that. I think way too many people wear mental health as a mask. And while I'm not going to diagnose anybody, as somebody who's literally diagnosed with the things some people claim to have without diagnosis, I'm here to put a real face of this for people so that you understand the ins and outs. But you might not see a lot of the ups and downs because I'll say it again. When the manic low hit, I take a break. I healthily soothe and get my mind back to where it needs to be. I'm not going to sit in front of the camera during a manic low. That is, that's not the way to do it. But I'm going to wrap this section up. Check it. Fingers crossed if fully taped. I am so worried because I don't normally use my phone like this. I like the camcorder, but for some reason it only tapes in one format and it's hard to convert over. I'm old. I know there's probably easier ways and apps that I can download. I'm still learning all this, y'all, so I figured I'd just use my phone instead. So I am hopeful that this fully taped. Fingers crossed. Okay, let's get up. Slowly, steadily. Okay. You know, the point I make about lucidity and uh, mental health isn't to, like, browbeat or put people in a position of being uncomfortable. It really is to put a human face onto this because I've seen so many people act out on this website especially and then utilize the excuse that, oh, it's their mental health and... I think why it bothers me so much and why I decided to really start vlogging and speaking out as somebody with diagnosed schizophrenia, sociopathy, bipolar disorder, is there are such comical leans sometimes for people. 
They always act out, act like a baby. The unhealthy, toxic sides of it is always, you know, highlighted. And I don't think a lot of people realize that there are millions of humans with mental health issues that live normal lives, as weird as that sounds, that deal with being intellectually capable, but having minds that sometimes work against us. And it is frustrating to see people only highlight the sideshow acts of this reality for us. I think it's hard when I see people literally were rewarded, it feels like, with platforms saying things like, oh, I'm manic, like it, like it's an accessory, like it's an excuse for bad behavior. And if you've lived as long as I have with what I have, you realize that people take advantage of what it means to be crazy. People legitimately will go on the record and say, well, you can't blame me for what happened or your mental health shame. And then no, I think that's why the whole crazy defense bothers me because I know even when I don't have lucidity, even when I'm hearing things and dealing with a low, that I still am the person making the choices at the end of the day, whether it's a choice to be angry, whether it's a choice to avoid, whether it's a choice to just shut down, period, that's 10. And it takes time, therapy, and support to get through stuff like that. What bothers me is when people act like they only want to see the negative aspects, whether it's a Hollywood portrayal or whether it's your favorite messy YouTuber. It's funny to some people to see the negative manic. You don't understand that true mania is ups, downs, and sometimes just a lull. Just that numb feeling that you're just going through your emotions because you have to. Because it's the only familiarity. And I was thinking about why some people lean into really toxic addiction behaviors. And it is to fill a void. Whether it's a food void. Because for some of us, food brought comfort. I think that was one of the things as a child that I could rely on more than anything else was being able to stuff my face and get in that dopamine head. And it is a really toxic trait to break, especially when you realize that you don't need it anymore, but you still feel that source of dopamine from it when you do it. And that's why I don't look down on other addicts either, because I know they're using it to fill a need. And until they find a better, less toxic way to fill that need, that is what they're going to do. And I think when you understand that you have a bit more sympathy for people, you don't let them get away with stuff, but you can see why they do it and it gives you a better understanding. I think the problem is there are too many people taking advantage of our reality and it's frustrating. I know one of the things people keep saying to me, and I hear you and I don't care, is the teeth thing. I don't hide my dental stuff, not because I don't get upset at times when I look at myself. I do, and it's a mental thing for me. Seeing the damage that the bulimia did to myself keeps me focused. It keeps me from stuffing and doing that again. My teeth didn't originally get damaged from the bulimia. I had already fallen when I was a kid and busted my front teeth. I dealt with dentists that were kind of sadistic, so I did not want to go back when my caps fell off. And then when I com- yeah, you're fine, honey. When I combine that with binging and purging, it made the frontal damage even worse. Now, granted, I've had people give the advice, oh, you can get those fixed, you can, and I will when I'm at the size that I feel comfortable. This is to keep me from super binging and purging ever again. When I look at the damage I have done to myself, I it keeps me on the right path. And I know it's hard for some people to believe, but when I can see the scars, it helps remind me of what I've done to myself. That is one of the main reasons that I'm nowhere near where I want to be yet. 
So I am not going to worry about superficial things. So I hope that answers some people's questions on, why don't you just get your teeth fixed? I know people make assumptions. I don't care. You want to assume that I've done worse things? Go ahead. I know my history. I know what I'm willing to do. I know I'm a nerd and I'm okay with people assuming that I was a bad girl when I really wasn't. I just think that it's easy for me to put out there that this was the result of binging and purging. This is what happens when you throw up after shoving copious amounts of food into your mouth. And yes, I will address it when the time comes. But until I'm back at the weight that I feel most comfortable, there is no reason for me to focus on things that, I mean, it's not causing a negative impact. I brush my teeth every day. I do everything I can to maintain as much oral health as I can. But I do utilize this to remind me of those dark days where I thought I could sneak and get away with it and stuff and then purge it back up. It is not a good place to be in. And as long as I can see the damage, I don't go back to that life. And that is just my training. And that is how I've mentally trained myself to keep on the right path. So I hope this portion really helps people understand that mindset just a little bit more. And why I need to be like this. Because, you know, I know it's not going to stop people who think they can insult and ding me with it. Okay. If that's what you want to waste a comment on, go ahead. I applaud you for wasting your time. But honestly speaking, I've lived with this damage for years. I know it's there. I see it every morning when I look in the mirror. I see it every time I do a Bonnet Chronicles, every time I talk. If I wanted to hide it, I would have. But I would rather directly address why there's dental damage. And hopefully put to rest anybody who's just curious. But also, now you can respond to anybody who goes, oh, look at her teeth. Why is her teeth so messed up? And understand, yes, it was a result of bulimia. And it wasn't a good time for me. And it wasn't a proud moment for me. And when I see the damage I did to myself, it keeps my head straight. It keeps me on the right path of doing what I need to do. Now, like I said, some people said they liked this format. I'm kind of shocked by that, but I got the first attempt at this, and it was finally successful after the technical second attempt that it didn't record. I'm going to keep doing these because a lot of these people who say, oh, no, believe me, I'm on a weight loss journey, guys, but instead you constantly see them what they eat, shoveling food in their face, and this can't be a feeder channel. I'm really trying to get my life back together after doing very clearly visible damage to my own body. And I just don't think that it's going to happen if you're sitting in front of a camera shoveling food in your face. So instead of the mukbang format, you know, you will get to see my routine for now. I'm hoping to get back to where I was before I started making excuses again. You know, at my best, I got to 40 minutes of doing this. Right now, I'm back to 30 because during the move, I made a lot of excuses. I think that's, if you're honest about weight loss when you're my size... You will be honest about the times where you make excuses for why you can't do your five days on, two days off. I'm back at a solid 30 minutes. I think that's good for activities. But I could be doing better. And I should be doing better. And the only way I'm going to do better is if I keep at it and I keep pushing myself. I think it's hard though. And I'm not saying that to make excuses. But when you get to a certain size, especially on my frame, the pain days are more, especially add that I'm older than 40 now. So there are days where you wake up and it's like, oh, my back, my legs, everything else. 
but you got to keep going. And I know that in the age of rapid results, in the age of people trying to sell you instant fitness and a bottle or pill and sell you a fantasy, for those of us who are morbidly obese, super morbidly obese, you have to understand that this journey needs to be slow and steady. It needs to be an actual commitment to stuff. And you need to have the mindset that you're not doing this to win anything but a better life where your body is in a cage. One of the things I had to work through in therapy especially, given what happened to me when I was younger, was I thought of fat as a body armor. And I still think of fat. As a literal body armor, it, for me, from what society even told me, repels most people. They will either mock or avoid. So in my brain, I twisted that to think that being bigger would keep me safe. Being a bigger woman would keep dudes from bothering me. And I learned, even in Florida, that's not the case. If somebody wants to attack you, they'll attack you. So, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not true. It's not a good mindset to have. And you have to work through that. I would much rather get to a point where I can lift a bit better without having a hernia spring up and having to have that crap cut out of me. Be able to turn this into actual muscle and protect myself that way. And like I said, I know some people are like, well, what about your partner? Why don't he protect you? He can to a certain extent, but being able to defend and protect myself, for me, will give me a better peace of mind, a healthier mindset than to depend on somebody else to do it. I'm a Gen Xer. I don't think it's in my DNA to depend on somebody else fully ever. I'm used to handling stuff myself. And that's why I said, the insulating myself with the weight, I thought I was protecting myself. I thought I was giving myself a big body armor. And you have to get out of that mindset. Now, I know I have to get better at recording stuff like this. You know, I know that better camera angles. The camcorder I bought, I'm still trying to figure that conversion of stuff out. So as we do more of these, I will try my best whew, to get better angles, get better sound, all of that stuff. Because honestly, I think these are better than watching people chew and eat. You know, I'm sorry if the sound of the bike might be a little annoying, but I would much prefer to hear this than to hear chewing and smacking and a lack of story. Because a lot of times these people have nothing to really say. They just want their feeders to watch them eat. And this isn't to knock all mukbangers. I know that there are more professional ones on here, even though I still really don't understand it personally. And they get up there and they eat and they have a good time and they talk different things because they have that personality. But some of the more famous ones or infamous ones, they just want you to watch them eat and maybe trauma dump if they're having a bad day or, you know, substitute y'all for friends that they don't really have in their lives. And, you know, I know that people don't think in the digital format as a way of socializing and that's silly because you can meet make friends you can meet the literal loves of your lives on here you can meet the people that you want to be your people but you still got to do the actual work and effort to be a friend some people develop these weird parasocial relationships but it's not just the fans of somebody it is the person in front of the camera who utilizes you for those views and that finance and that expect you to do things for them because they don't like talking about that aspect of parasocial. They don't like talking about that aspect of using people as attack dogs as some of them have, of gathering groups and acting like the victim and then turning your loyal minions as you turn them into against people. There are so 
many internet personalities that do that crap. And they love to talk about, oh, we don't want the, the parasocial relationship. You're not our friends, but you love exploiting these people who do pretty much idolize you because of the stuff you say and the stuff you do on here. So let's not get that crap twisted. It's a two-way street with this. And if you can't respect the people that enjoy your content, you don't deserve those people. And that is 100% me keeping it 100. I think that it is way more interesting if you're truly looking to better your life to keep at it. There is no rapid way to do this right. Every time I've had rapid weight loss, yeah, I got the quick results. Yeah, I felt a little cute. But it wasn't getting through to the mental stuff. And so, whenever I got to the point where it's just like, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like being active. I'm going to eat my feelings. All the work done got eroded. And that is the reality of somebody who goes through all kinds of emotional cycles with my mental health. There are days where it's a bit harder to stay on track, stay on task. And it is okay if you're like this too. The point is getting to a point where you don't give up. The point is getting to a point where you do keep the commitment up. It's not easy. And I don't ever want anybody to tell you that doing this is going to be easy for you. Especially if you've gotten over 300. Especially if your frame is smaller. Especially if you're female. There is a lot that goes on in our head with hormones especially. And I'm not saying that to knock the dudes. I'm sure you go through stuff too, but I don't know. I don't have testosterone, so I can't tell you about that. I can only tell you about the hormones that I've had going through my body for 40 plus years now. And how it affects my brain patterns at time. How it affects my moods. There are times where you get super depressed. If you're honest about it, you understand that. It's frustrating because you're mad at what you did to yourself. You're mad at this world being so fucked up that you thought doing this to yourself is natural and normal. And that this is the way you're protecting yourself, which that's not, it's not right. But it feels right because you just don't want people to bother you. If you're honest, a lot of this is because you just don't want people to bother you. And you want that one Thing in your life that has never judged you, never let you down, always gives you that quick dopamine hit. And when you stop letting that be the way you handle the problem, when you get help, especially. And now that we're in the digital age, there is online therapy. I don't know if that one bigger one, I don't think I'd fuck with that because I really don't like those weird, we gotta have sponsors type of therapy since. For me, therapy is such a personal thing, and I'd be worried about using something like that where people are literally sponsoring it. I don't know. That's just my paranoia. But I honestly think that even if that's the case, teledocs are a godsend, especially when you have agoraphobia, especially when you're dealing with literally being a shut-in. Having that doctor, whether it's video or phone, could save your life. And I know that some people still, even in this day, scoff at therapy, think a therapist might, you know, change their life too much. They, they get fearful of talking to people. And I would, I'm telling you, with all seriousness, you should do it. You should find the person that you can have these conversations with. Even if it's just once a month, find a person that is clinically and actually able to. Don't just talk to strangers on this app. Don't just trauma dump. You need to work it out with somebody who's going to talk to you back, give you insightful ways to navigate your trauma and your issues. That is the point of therapy. 
That's the point of a good therapist, and there are a lot out there. There are a lot of good psychiatrists for people like me with serious mental health issues as well. I got to send doctor, my doctor almost gave her name away, the book that I wrote. Because when I started going back to psychiatry four years ago when we got up here, after moving up with my mom and having a then near close nervous breakdown again, I told the doctor that, yeah, I want to finish up the story that I started years ago, but I'm not sure about it. I wasn't sure about anything at that point. I was just so tired. I was giving up again. I let my everything go, and I was just, even being in a relationship wasn't enough at that point. And it was going to the doctor, talking to her once a month, and just letting out my feelings. Learning how to set healthy boundaries against toxic people. Learning how to say no to certain behaviors. Knowing that, yeah, the stuff I did was wrong, but there was a reason for why I justified a lot of the stuff I did. And it helps. And I can't say it more than that. All I can do is continue to try to be living proof that if you don't give up, the results aren't going to be quick. You're not always going to see rapid changes to your body when you commit to stuff, but you'll feel it. That's the best way I can put it. Being able to stand longer without it winding you, being able to walk without breathing like you're, you need an oxygen tank, eventually getting off any breathing machines if you need one of those, that is the benefit of changing your routine. And can, especially when you're bigger, you can only do so much when you put so much fat on your body. But commit to any kind of active routine. Whether when you're like, because I was close to 500 pounds, but I had to start small. I had to start literally walking up and down the trail that my uh, grandparents had in Bennettsville. Just walking from my room all the way up to the top of the house, back and forth. And that, to me, was some good exercise. Then after we got down enough for the weight loss surgery, I had a Benoit ball. So we started getting down on the floor, which is scary when you're bigger, and then getting back up. That was an exercise I'm going to try to start doing again, even though I now have hardwood floors, so it's going to be a bit harder, but it's not impossible. But getting down, getting back up is good training for both your joints, good training for you mentally, because I know, for me, and I can't speak for any other big person, but once you get to a certain size, the fear of going down onto the ground, the floor, it's, it's paralyzing because you don't want to be stuck. You don't want to get into a position where you even have to even remotely ask somebody to help you back up. And it's embarrassing. And I don't want to start tearing up from it. But it does embarrass you when you know that getting down could mean that you might have to ask somebody to help you up and potentially hurt them. And that's the reality. And instead of feeling ashamed of that, you got to practice. I wish it was an easy thing. And I wish it didn't feel like the world mocks and sometimes pities us with comedy. Because I know a lot of people think, well, you did this to yourself. A lot of addicts do things to themselves. Whether it's food addict, sex addict, drug addict, a lot of people do things to themselves to try to fill a hole of void that this world has put into us. And sometimes we find out before it's too late that what we're doing isn't working and isn't enough, but it still does damage. And it's on us to try to undo a lot of this damage that the trauma, that ourselves and our action did to our bodies. And I just want more people to understand that there are those people like me that understand that. We understand that there are days when you just, you're just tired. You're just tired of dealing with shit. You're tired of dealing with this world. You're just tired of feeling like a freak. And you just want to feel better. And there's no instant way of feeling better. 
so you do what you can. But there are those sad days, and you gotta, gotta talk to somebody. Because you can get to a point where you understand the sad days better, and still do what you gotta do. You can really train your brain, because that is our original muscle, to get past those days that you, you almost feel like you're not feeling it. But it takes time, and getting help was one of the main reasons I decided to get back on, start seriously committing to this. And like I said, I've seen people talk about certain mukbangers especially, going back to their habits because this is how they make their money on YouTube. And I'm not going to lie, I would love to make the extra income on YouTube, but I am definitely not family friendly. I'm probably never going to truly be ad friendly. I'm an old school New York chick, born in the 70s. I cuss. I am blunt. I like to talk about stuff without having to really censor or filter myself. I don't enjoy the new rules for YouTube to be, you know, monetized. So that was never truly the goal. And given that my path is writing and creating with my friends, the web comics and books and stuff, I really don't care if this ever gets monetized. I don't think it will because I'm not afraid to talk about serious things, whether it's my past assault, whether it's my past violence, whether it's just things about me that people might find interesting as I exercise, because I honestly think that an exercise bong instead of a mukbang is better for those who claim to be on a weight loss journey. Instead of seeing me shoveling food into my face, which I'm trying to not develop a toxic aversion to food now, <laughs> and that is a bad thing with people with my mental health issues. Because you can go from binging to complete aversion. And this is the stuff that, if you're honest, you have to work through. And I don't want to do that either because that is definitely unhealthy. It is a lot that goes on in the minds of those who have to deal with extreme weight. And I just want people to try just a little bit to understand what this is like. Understand that, yeah, there are those frauds. There are those people that get on here and they're using this as either their excuse or for encouragement and stuff. And they form those weird relationships with people. And I'm not going to do that with y'all. I'm not going to lie to you. I do have people on here that started following me early on on both Twitter and this site that I do interact and talk to because I've been doing it for years, but I can't do that with everybody. So if you're going to bother to leave any comments and stuff, I will try my best to respond to as many as I can, but I can't promise that I get to everybody. And I used to love being able to do that on Twitter, and then it got to a point where it was getting harder and harder and it felt like I was making excuses why I couldn't do it. Especially since a lot of people still were people I interacted with on a daily basis. And I enjoy the friends I've made on here. I enjoy the new people I've met on here. I think the digital age has opened up a lot of doors for those of us who are truly antisocial, who don't really trust the world but do still want to interact with other human beings and find people who aren't going to treat us like crap just because. And I, like a lot, of, especially old New Yorkers, tend to gravitate to more realer people. Tend to gravitate towards people who speak their mind, who aren't afraid to have a stance, whether everybody agrees with them or not. Real people. And I think that when you are real and when you do have a genuine passion for what you do, it shines through. And, you know... I think that's why, especially now on YouTube, because I, I, I like normal people for kiddos' sake. I made my account years ago, and I was just originally going to upload home movies and videos to the format, and then I forgot about it. I came back in 2016 temporarily to watch the art community channels, and 
that turned into a debacle of drama, stalking, and everything else. So I took about a two-year break. Anything except uploading my Twitch content to YouTube, I tried to avoid this site. Because between burning out from fake commentary channels and just the constant stream of drama and the elevation of trash people to literal star format, I was just like, you know what? I don't think this site's for me. So I took a bit of a break. But like everything, the world kind of went kitty wampus. Like most, everybody came kind of a shut in. And I don't know about y'all, but TV just doesn't hit for me the way it used to when I was a kid. I don't get as excited about scripted TV like some people do. Never really been into a lot of the reality shows, especially since I know what goes on in a lot of the production for those shows. How a lot of stuff is crafted. Sorry to burst your bubble. A lot of the people that my mom used to love watching are sitting in jail now or divorced because those shows aren't real, TLC. <laughs> so, I didn't have much <clears throat> to have in the form of entertainment outside anime, which I still love anime. But, um, I started watching more Twitch streams, and then I went back to YouTube watching other people's commentating and other stuff, and I realized I can get back into YouTube. I just have to navigate and stay away from the fake ass fucks and just find the people that make me laugh, make me want to sit and watch their content. And I still like long form content. So those people who do the true crime stuff, like Annie Elise, the people who do like documentary series like Snook and Next Pro and the Internet Archivist. There are so many of you young people. I love the way you see the document history or, or things like that. Stuff like Briefcase, the crime reel, the do historical crime. There are so many people who are passionate on YouTube about stuff. And then, I'm not gonna lie, I like certain food things. I don't like the eating sounds, but that's why when I do watch people like eat like man versus food, he doesn't, you don't normally hear a lot of his chewing and eating. You know, you watch him take on a challenge and beat the challenge. I don't mind that. Then you have the ASMR channels of people who make lunches uh, for their family. And that's about it for the food content for me. Because you normally don't hear a lot of eating unless it's a mama room. And the way she does it to me is cute. So I don't mind listening to her crunch stuff so that we can hear how crunchy it is. I think the way she edits and does her content makes it palatable. So that that's my YouTube journey. I do miss the art community. I wish there were more out there drawing, telling their stories, but I do feel like their community was rocked by a lot of fake people who just ruined the field. Whether they were the abusers who harmed their partners, or the literal stalker who tried to act like she was about social justice and ended up just being a super horrible person. It is hard now to be an art YouTuber and try not to deal with that legacy. And it's sad because it really was a community that I felt strongly supporting. And now it's pretty much non-existent for me. I don't even look at it anymore. And it's, it's kind of sad. And as for commentary, right now, outside people who commentate on YouTube stuff, I don't really watch a lot of celebrity commentary channels anymore. And I don't watch things like the super drama stuff. Right now, I keep my commentary to reaction channels because they'll watch people's stuff. They'll give their opinions. And a lot of time, we're on the same page about certain things, especially when somebody lies. Now, I'm not going to lie, I did try the other day to do my own reaction to somebody's foolishness, but I don't think I could do that for a living. I honestly get so annoyed with people, and I like to cuss, I like to be loud, I like to tell people get the fuck out of here, because sometimes they need to really get the fuck out of here. I have absolutely 
no interest in trying to be YouTube friendly when it comes to my reactions to people's fuck shit on this app. I just, I can't do it. So that's why I know that while this is fun for me, doing this vlog and just showing you this journey for me is fun, I would literally not be able to make a living on here and I'm not trying to. This is just extra. This is just a way for me to keep documenting, keep on the right path, keep committed to what I intend to do. You know, I threw the week off a bit because yesterday I had a dizzy spell. And this isn't to make excuses, but that's why I'm exercising today. So I didn't push myself quite as hard. And I don't want to get in the mindset of, well, Jen, you got to take it easier. I, taking it easy put me in this place. So no taking it easy. We got to keep going. We have to build back up. I was at 40 minutes at my best on the bike with 15 minutes of arms. I'm back to 10 minutes of arms with the weight and 20 minutes, about 30 minutes on the bike. So 30 all together, five days a week, two days off so that I can rest and get myself in a better mindset. And it's helping because it's a commitment to something. Once the weather is warm again, we have a big plot of land to walk around because walking does help. The pool is what I'm most looking forward to getting put on the land because I really do feel like my best weight loss results was from swimming. I will say it again, I love the water. I love to swim. I think swimming is just because you don't feel like you're doing too strenuous exercise if you swim right. And you could spend literal hours just enjoying the water and the pool. I don't recommend hours per se, but you know what I mean. It's an activity and an exercise that, especially for bigger people, you can do without causing a lot of strain. You can also do water aerobics, which helps with tension and making your body able to do more and go a bit further. So it really is in the plans to get myself back to a, a fitter life. I'm not gonna lie to you guys and ask like, oh, I'm gonna completely slim down because that is definitely still not my goal. And I don't care if people agree to that or not. It's not your life, it's my life. But I do wanna be in a more maintainable, easier to get around body than I'm currently at. And that is my current goal that is all I currently care about and that is what I'm pushing for and I think when you're that honest it makes it easier but there's my third y'all I feel sweaty <laughs> but good I'm glad that I found the format to these home vlogs that I might be able to add to this uh, format along with, you know, things from around the house. I'm going to make some lumpia later. I love chicken lumpia. I wish I had some bean sprouts, but it's hard to get fresh bean sprouts around here. I'll probably complain a little bit about that later, but it is what it is. But other than that, going to have a Bonnet Chronicles later on tonight, too, because it is Friday. This was a rough week. Halloween was a rough day. A lot of stuff I tried to record didn't work out. So, you know, it's not going to be a full week vlog week this time of uploads. But I think what I've got content-wise is decent. And I do like the idea of the bike format instead of taping... People watching people tape themselves, eat themselves to death. You can watch that I'm serious about committing to this exercise. I am going to be 100%. I was embarrassed to show my full frame at first because of the damage I did to myself. Like most, I take pictures from a certain angle because, I don't know, I just didn't want to show it. But you know what? If you can't be honest about what you want to work on, then you're not going to really work on it. So I'm honest. And that's all I can do and say. But I'm going to stop this section and get myself cooled down, clean up, and work on, hopefully, dinner for later and everything else.
I just wanted to show you a quick up close of the glistening of the sweat. 30 minutes really does do what I think it does to help keep me motivated. I think a lot of people don't realize that you really can commit to this. Is it easy? No, but it is worth it if you're serious about doing this, especially if you're serious about doing this and you still have old habits and patterns, whether it's snacking, whether it's uh, crutch eating when you need an emotional crutch, you really do have to pair it with some physical activity. And these recumbent bikes do hold up to a certain poundage, I think 450 pounds even. So you might, if you're serious about this and you're a bigger person, want to commit to some form of exercise equipment that can hold your frame and then just start slow. That is the best advice I can give. It is no shame of starting slow if you really want to do this. But I'm going to wrap this part up. So, you know... I did react last time to Chantal's video, her late night cry sympathy bait session stream, and this is just a quick follow up to that because, yeah, I saw the double chicken burger thing. I kind of reacted to that on the Bonnet Chronicles, but I got annoyed because I really, truly cannot sit through her mukbangs. I cannot sit through her eating stuff. It, it's not even triggering. It's just enraging at this point. Because she knows what she's doing. And then this latest one that I watched on uh, Girl uh, Please. And Girl Please, I love your channel. I love your accent. It is so much fun to listen to you and your takes on this. But listening to Girl Please, we pretty much both came to the same conclusion that Chantel, it's all an act. Having Salah come in towards the end with his, oh yeah, babe, ah. Uh, this is better than the Cheesecake Factory, like a, a weird robotic line give, because you still, and I know you'll say, it's for privacy, guys, we can't show him eating for privacy, even though I've gone out to restaurants with him, and I've shown him pointing at stuff, I won't show you eating, or, or him actually enjoying my food for privacy, but he'll come in and say a robotic line to prove that we're still together, when you lie so much, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you cue his script in towards the end. There's no chemistry there. And you can't fake that. You can't fake a back and forth with somebody you don't have actual appeal with. It's just, it's whatever. But I think what set me off and what made me want to do this follow-up without using her stuff, because I know she loves to say, oh, you've got to use my stuff to give views. No, bitch, I can read you without even putting your face up there. It was the backstory with the, the false tears, as we say when we play Pokemon, because there's a literal attack called false tears that's supposed to distract and deflect the, the, the attack of the opponent. You're not going to do that. Your tears mean nothing to me. I keep telling you, and I won't stop saying it because I am diagnosed as a sociopath. We can feel emotions. It's just like a switch for me, and I, I feel nothing for you. I feel that you're trying to game a system that has paid off, but I am hoping that your downfall happens sooner than later because you need to hit rock bottom. You need to hit the financial rock bottom. Because it's the only way you are going to see that this shit won't work for you. It is infuriating to me when you bring up your past charity as you sit in front of a meal that could have fed a small family, if not an actual large family, depending on the culture and where you're at. You shoveled a bunch of calories into your face and then you're trying to tell us you're not miserable. What, did, what, what are you doing then? You are literally trying to fill a void, Chantal. And you can blame your addiction and every other past trauma, stuff, but you're not doing anything to get it help. So how are you supposed to prove to those of us who have been calling out your misery that you're not miserable? Come on, man. But what kills me is the tears about somebody else's issues and, and the supposed trauma that you felt working in this charitable place, helping people who are unfortunate and I get that you might have felt some kind of emotion, but 
because I don't believe you because I know as a sociopath, peer manipulation is something, it's like textbook 101. So I don't know what you're doing in this latest series, but you're really funny at this point. It's fun to watch you continue to cosplay this situation out. But that whole Sala bit at the end, that was just like complete like comedy gold. I was <laughs> over y'all. The way he delivered that line made me feel like, wow. And it feels like you really did watch my video, which thank you for it. But that what my partner did before, he's out of the house right now. I don't feel anxiety, y'all, from it either. But him coming in because he hears me recording, that's natural. He does that all the time. He likes to help out. He likes to be involved. Because when you live together and you love each other, that's what they do from time to time. But I made it clear. I don't want him or kiddo to have to feel like they have to be props for this vlog. But sometimes you will see them. Sometimes they want to be a part of things. What drives me up a wall, though, is the fact that you watch what I said, and instead of trying to have a more natural reaction with your partner, you did that. I just, I think at this point, you know you're a self-parody, and that's what you want to do. You want everybody to just lean in to either make it fun of you or bullying you, so you can say, see, there are those haters, get them, YouTube. But honey, we can read you without using your stuff, without directly attacking you personally i can attack the shit that i see the mental shit that you try to do and the fact that you are literally leaning in to be in a parody and that's why it's fun to call you out the way i do i don't want to keep reacting to your content though it makes me upset it upsets me watching you destroy your body and then you want to blame everything but yourself and until you understand that the root of the equation is you, you're never going to change. And I've got stuff to do. I want to get this Saturday going. I've got writing to do. I've got work to do. So I'm going to get to that. But I just, I had to say it after watching that this morning yet again, that Chantel, I want you to change for your health wise. But if you never change, I will continue to laugh at how ridiculous you are. For real, seriously. <laughs> yeah, here a bit of the sizzling. This is just a basic four-pot ingredient chicken lumpia. You've got the green beans, you've got onion, you've got uh, soybeans, and you got chicken and potatoes. It is meat and veg, basically. You cook it down with the bean sprouts. Let me get my... Bamboo spatula here. You want to make sure to rinse and cook your bean sprouts too. That's the reason why we can't get these here in the states willy nilly because a lot of weirdo wannabe health nuts decided, oh, we don't have to wash and cook our bean sprouts. We can just slap them on a salad. Salmonella poisoning? What's that? And it's because of numb nuts like that. And yeah, I know, I use frozen french fries this time. I'm sorry, y'all, I did not feel like cutting up potatoes for this recipe. And, you know, a lot of it uses leftovers, leftover chicken, leftover things that you can get from your fridge. So it's a really easy recipe to do. It's simple. You get it cooked down. You can wrap it up into an egg roll wrap. And it's delicious. You have it with sweet chili sauce or vinegar sauce that we make. And it's just a family recipe that we've passed down over time. It's cheap. It's easy to make. I think at the most, the stuff would cost you about 12 bucks altogether if you buy the chicken the way I do. So it is affordable. And like I said, it, it's a good fill-you-up meal. You know, I've got the wraps over here. And we'll be rolling those up in just a bit. But it really is delicious. And we're going to let this cook down. Get it nice and soft. Then let it cool down because you don't want to put hot filling in the wraps. If you do that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a mess. 
there's a lot that you learn over the years making egg rolls, especially with egg roll filling. I know some people like to use cabbage and carrots and stuff, and I've made those traditional ones too. But this was passed down by an auntie, and everybody in the family likes it. I've had people who didn't like the traditional egg rolls that like the, this filling better, and it just works for us. Whew, almost dropped it. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to keep cooking this down, and then we are going to use a wok over here to fry them up. I'm telling you, y'all, it is a good cold weather staple. So yes, I know I had my dish towel near the stove. I, <laughs> I'm telling you, some of the things you catch as you start to tape yourself doing stuff like this, and you've critiqued other people how they cook in their cooking videos and stuff, because instead of just showing their work, they rather try to show themselves. I'm not vain. I know you're here to see the food I make, not me. So I, at least I hope you're not here to see me, because honestly, I'm an old woman. You don't really need to see that. But for me, seeing stuff done in the kitchen means your result. And I do like the results of this lumpia. I, I think it's going to make some good eats. And I'm excited about it. Get these sprouts cooked down just a little more though. Because I don't play with salmonella. I don't, mm -mm. You got to cook your stuff. The chicken was already seasoned, but I will throw a little bit more pepper and stuff towards the end. I don't like to heavily season. I'm over 40, so you need to be careful for high cholesterol, high sodium, and all that stuff too. You know, not that I have to explain this to the people who follow me, but I do know. I'm black, and you, you know, people be like, I don't look seasoned. Trust me, I do my seasoning. If you need a refresher... If you need a refresher, just in case, that's just a mini spice rack. But ba bam, I like my seasoning. I don't play with the seasoning, y'all. I'm not. I'm not trying to have a house without the necessities. But I just wanted to say, yeah, I noticed it when I was heating stuff up that I had my dish towel way too close to the oven. I moved it. <laughs> All right, so you're going to need a bowl of water, and then I put the finished wraps on the plate. We're about to start wrapping these egg rolls, y'all, and as we do that, I'm probably going to face the camera towards me so you can see my hand techniques, and, you know, it's just a basic wrap style that I use to make sure that they stay tight. But another thing is I have some things I want to just talk about, you know, I was in a chat early on and, you know, I did say some things and I have no regret over the things I say, but maybe if I clarify just a little bit my point of view on stuff as a 46 year old who I'm not acting like my life is perfect. I'm messed up here and there, but I know what I want in life and I'm determined to get the things I want in life. And I think if I just impart that wisdom while I'm wrapping up my family's meal, you'll get to know what I meant early on. All right, we are back after making sure that everything cools down. Let's get this adjusted here. Focus can be on the actual plate as we get these wrapped up. Eventually, I will get the camcorder stuff figured out so that I can actually focus on my hands better. And I'll just do a couple of these so that you can learn the basic technique. Uh oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, y'all. The joys of trying the home vlog. I apologize for that. Give me just a moment to aim this cam. It's a little bit better. Now you want your folding to be in a diamond pattern. It's easy to make the envelope from a diamond pattern. So you take the wrap. These are square. You want to point the tip up to say. I know my friends who are in the gill with me will probably make tip jokes. Don't care guys. I know. Cal always says stuff that you can use as an entendre. I'm used to it.
but you want the tip to be up you want it to be in the diamond pattern because it's easy to do I use my hands for this my hands are always clean I know that's a running gag with a certain uh, person on here but I do I am a, a, a OCD clean freak and I'm gonna go wash my hands after this this is cooled down just enough from earlier to wrap up proper and you want to make sure for me since I'm still as, not as good as like my aunties or my grandma and them any of this you want to roll I put just enough filling and then I roll it and then I tuck you roll and you tuck and then you roll it nice and tight oh, onion there you want to wet the out, outer edges too so that it grips when you bring it together and then you tightly roll this looks kind of like a spring roll I could have probably filled this one a little tighter a little filler but you know the ones I made before were sort of thick and I don't want to overdo it I'll get another one here Oof, I grabbed two remember diamond side point that tip up grab your filling and like I said this is a simple recipe you've got your meat you got your veg you've got your potato all in one the green beans give a nice snap the potato give a nice uh, mouthfeel to the chicken and it just to me is one of the better fillings and I've had it since I was a little girl so I really do like and enjoy eating it you know I know that lumpia is a very versatile dish and if you're from the islands you know that there are plenty there's even dessert ones out there one of my friends was telling me that she had a deep freezer with uh, a banana or maybe a mango one I think she was saying the cool thing about these wraps are you can use them for sweet or savory things southwestern style is another style I'll do if we make like fajitas one night and there's leftovers the next day for lunch I will chop it up a bit more get them down fine and then what I'll do is I will sprinkle just a little bit of cheese in there because I don't like too much cheese and stuff sorry I know big girl that doesn't like a bunch of cheese oh I don't believe you but yeah um a little bit of cheese, a little bit of the fajita stuff. Roll it up nice and tight. Fry those up and you can put them into a dip. Mostly a pico dip. And it's just good eats. But what I like about this lumpia recipe is this really is a full dinner in one. And, you know, it's a family favorite. This recipe was passed down by an auntie that had looked after my mom when she was younger and then my mom gave us her rendition of it you know and I think I change up just a little bit of mine because I do I don't get Goya here as easily as we did in the south so I changed up my seasoning blend a bit and I like the rice wine vinegar to season I also have MSG, but I don't get to use that as much because I don't want the family complaining about, oh, you put MSG in our stuff, you know. So what happens when you literally marry a, a small town guy from up here? They they still have those weird fears of MSG. So even though I do use a lot of products that do still have MSG in it, I try not to put it in too much of what the family ingests all the time. It just saves any potential arguments and stuff. You know, it's certain compromises when you cook. Things that you're used to and that you can eat is fine. But you should be mindful of the people you live with. We'll do one more of these. But I also wanted to get to what I originally was going to tape myself doing this and talk about. Because I was in a chat. And I did make a comment about being 40 and being a homeowner. I'm proud of that because I, like every Gen Xer, have had my F-up moments. 
my moments of, oh man, I should have been smarter with my finances, my life decisions, even. I, I think there's nobody over 40 in my generation that didn't step in it at least once, twice, or three times. You know, I'm not acting like I'm a perfect being, but when I flex on the fact that I'm 46 now, uh, I'm a new homeowner, it is to say that in spite of my own fuck-ups and poor life choices early on, before there was an internet to really document all the stupid things that I used to do, I got my stuff together. And if I was making 20 grand a freaking month, like a certain little miss, I don't need money now, guys. I'm, I'm totally enjoying the modest life now, guys. Bullcrap that I watched earlier. I don't take back what I said. If by 40 you're making that kind of money, and I say that as somebody who worked a corporate job and squandered lots of money, regret, regrettably squandered lots of money, if that is what you're making and you waste it, then no, I, I don't feel bad saying to you that you could have had a house. And I will not take that back. I get that it's a point of contention for some people, and I get debt. You know, I understand that sometimes you get yourself into holes that you have to dig yourself out of. But her hole was a dirty mattress with a meth guy that she tried to buy. So no, I don't regret saying that by 40, little Miss Chantal should have had a home. She could have had a home or she could have at least paid off her debts, but she didn't do that. And as somebody who has messed up, but had the wherewithal and the drive and the determination to have better and more, and keep pushing towards that because you have to be motivated and you really have to want it and have that desire and not depend on karma to give it to you. No, I don't believe that little Miss Chantal deserves any grace or anything like that. But I'm going to end this part and then I'll show you the frying in just a bit. You want to make sure that your grease is nice and hot. And then you want to carefully drop your egg rolls in. Let them bubble. Don't be afraid of the fryer. I know some people get, oh, you gotta jump. Nah. If you've been doing this for as long as I have, and if you're a Gen Xer, you've probably been doing it since you were eight years old too, you can handle a little bit of pop. There are way too many people that try to play this up for, I don't know, funny, and oh, I didn't seal them down enough. And you can see that mistake, and I'm gonna own up. Some of them did not get sealed down with enough water. You want to make sure you use enough water so that these flaps don't come up. It shouldn't infect the integrity because I did do the roll method. So the filling won't get oily and stuff. But it could happen if you, re if you stuff them too much. If you don't seal down that flap properly, like this one over here. This one has a proper seal. It's not pushed up. But these like this... If I didn't do my tuck and roll method, it would have made the inside super oily, which is not fun. Nobody wants to bite down on lumpia and get a mouthful of oil. That is, ugh. Let's see, cooking mistakes happen. Even to people who are, like I like to think of myself as a seasoned frying pro. But they're almost done. As you can see, they're golden brown. You get this heat high enough, you don't have to wait long to uh, get them out. Let me get the colander ready. Give me just a moment here, y'all. There you go, finished product. Now, I could have tried to keep holding the camera and doing this. You know, it's not fancy vlog work here, y'all, and I'm not trying to burn my house down or burn myself. But, you know, I just wanted to show you the finished product, nice and golden brown. They'll be crispy. Got a garlic vinaigrette dip that I like to use for them or sweet chili sauce works as well. And it's just a really good eat. And, you know, I just enjoy making, especially during the fall, comfort foods and stuff. And it really isn't about focusing on me while I'm doing it. It is about the meal itself and what it means. And this recipe was passed down, so it makes it even more special.